I'm the CEO of Cove, the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship here in uh, sunny Halifax, Nova Scotia. We're pleased that you could join us today for a special presentation by Dr. John Ross, uh, who's the medical director of the Praxis Medical Group. John is an emergency physician and uh, he's had a, a 30 year plus career in emergency medicine. He serves as the medical director and is the co-founder of the Praxis Medical Group, which is a private sector telemedicine provider uh, supporting remote sites around the world, including medical, uh, including uh, marine sites. He's also a provincial advisor on emergency care to the Deputy Minister of Health here in Nova Scotia. John completed his medical school at the University of Western Ontario, an internship at North York General Hospital, uh, I have to say where my oldest son was born, and he did his residency in, in emergency medicine at Queen's University. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada, uh, specializing in emergency medicine. John's also a professor of emergency medicine at Dalhousie University, and he focuses there on acute airway management. He's also in past been a visiting professor in Dar el Salaam, Tanzania, uh, where he did uh, work in establishing emergency medical care in that country. Um, John's married, has been uh, so for more than 30 years. He has two sons. In his free time, he's involved in a number of sports, uh, including sailing, which we just had a wonderful talk about as we were doing our prep for this. Uh, enjoys traveling and spends time at his cottage in the mouth of the beautiful La Haye River here in, in Nova Scotia. Um, we've had, I've had the pleasure of having a number of discussions with John and his team at Praxis. Um, brilliant individual, wonderful uh, raconteur, uh, and a wicked sense of humor. So I, I know you're going to get a lot of good information out of uh, today's session, which will be focused on marine operations and um, what the impact has been of COVID-19 and how those marine operations can manage a return to business in the presence of COVID-19. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn uh, the microphone and the, uh, the camera over to John and uh, looking forward to an interesting discussion. If you do have questions, I'd invite you to um, pop into the chat session on, um, on um, Zoom and I'll be trying to watch that chat session and we'll be relaying questions to John at the end of this talk. Thanks very much and over to you, John. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, that, that detailed uh, intro, Jim. That's, that's great. I want, just, I want to thank uh, both, uh, both yourself as well as Leslie and Kyle, who's doing some techno background stuff for, from Cove for inviting me and, uh, and making this, uh, this, this opportunity available because I think it's, a, it's kind of, a, it, uh, we've been living this COVID business, certainly from our medical side of things, ever since it, it uh, started to wash up against the Canadian shores. And I, I know that everyone's been trying to figure this whole thing out and where, where, where it fits for them. So I, I hope this is gonna be useful. Uh, I, will, I will just uh, kind of just remind or, or reiterate the fact that I am an emergency physician. I'm not a, an infectious disease expert. I'm not a vi virologist. Um, but I, I hope that I bring some pragmatic aspects to the COVID discussion. Um, because uh, uh, we've been actually working with a lot of clients uh, to try and help them figure out how they can continue to work uh, in the COVID era that we now are finding ourselves in. So, so that's really the, the purpose of this exercise is just to try and uh, share some experiences. And then, and then I, I really don't want to talk too much. So I, I, want, I want to open this up for questions from people, um, uh, both either general questions or whether there are specific things to your, to your organization that you want to talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm guessing that it'll be useful for, for many uh, that are attending. Um, so again, thanks for, thanks for this. So um, my goal is to um, uh, just to kind of tell you a little bit about, about who and what, what is Praxis. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. This is you know, a marketing thing. Um, I, I, just a reminder about some of the basic healthcare needs of people who work in remote uh, uh, settings. And then we'll spend most of the time, of course, on, on just the COVID and, and, uh, and marine operations impacts, uh, some recommendations, and then open for questions. And the questions will be through the chat session um, uh, thing, so because I know that you are currently muted. Um, so again, uh, really Praxis uh, cut its teeth on and has been in existence for 23 years now, providing uh, medical support to those people who don't have access to the standard healthcare system. So when you push off from the wharf, your provincial healthcare system ends and uh, you're basically on your own to kind of figure things out. And companies provide that for, for seafarers, for employees, uh, individuals who push off on their boats uh, are also kind of uh, on the hook to try and figure out what to do if something happens out there. So um, we, we provide the 24 seven telemedicine service um, to, to those who, uh, who contact us. 
we also provide medical kits to people. Again, there's a lot of confusion around what, what should I carry on a boat uh, or in a marine setting or in my work setting. Um, we've been doing this now again for a long time. So we, we have a fair amount of experience with what actually works and what doesn't. We do some staffing and then we also do some occupational related marine type type work. And we also work with, with a number of different types of clients. Um, so here's a sort of an example, and I'm not going to go through them all, but it's, we started off in the, in the, in the offshore oil and gas world, uh, and then have luckily pivoted over time for, to, to non-fossil non fuel industry. And um, so we just basically sort of cover off a, a, anyone who happens to be operating in a, in a remote place um, is, a, is a potential um, group that may want to access some expert advice in, 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 uh, in remote medicine. So that's sort of what we, that's what we do. So what's telemedicine? Uh, again, really, really quickly, it, 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 uh, it wouldn't have been much of a knowledge item for, for many people um, prior to COVID happening. Uh, Nova Scotia was kind of slow to the game in terms of embracing telemedicine. Once COVID hit, all of a sudden, the doctors in Nova Scotia and the Department of Health got together and started talking about, oh, you know, how, how do we provide virtual care for, for, for land-based patients when doctors aren't going to be able to open their offices as usual. We don't want to be getting too close to each other. So all of a sudden, telemedicine and virtual care became a thing. And so some of you probably have already had virtual care appointments with your family doctor. And so we, we keep it really basic for, um, for people that are working in remote places. If the telephone is, is familiar to all. Um, the bat satellite bandwidths tend to be pretty narrow still and kind of patchy at times. So that tends to work um, pretty reliably. So we start with people on the phone, uh, we put them through some technology uh, to hook up with, with our doctors. And so we have multiple doctors on call every day and, and across the country. And so that the system kind of figures out who should we be connecting with, um, medical records are generated and we can start communicating through, again, telephone messaging, if that's, uh, if that's appropriate, if we send photos. And at some times we, we do video if that's available, but a lot of it's just telephonic medicine. And that's sort of the essential of, of what we would do, or what we've been doing for the last 23 years. So there are again basic health health needs before you leave. I think this is probably the most important, and uh, is is actually thinking about what could happen. And we've now been doing this as I as I say for quite a while. I can tell you that there's a long list of things that do happen, and so being prepared for that um, has real benefits. Uh, we find that some people are, are real, really good preparers and other people don't think about this stuff until it's sometimes too late. So being prepared is a really key part of uh, prior to going on trips. While you're at sea, there are basic sort of primary care issues, common colds and sort of fun, funny belly pains and things which are super common on land. They also happen at sea. Um, we deal with those, but we also deal with, with the things that, that, that people often get the attention around, you know, heart attack and, and uh, bad accidents and things like that. So uh, it's kind of a soup to nuts job and, and the telephone calls are always quite, uh, quite varied and interesting. Uh, and then the follow-up piece is that once people do get uh, some kind of medical thing, how do we get them back to work and through family doctors, occupational health or specialists or whatever. So that's kind of the, the comprehensive care piece of not only people on land, but it's the same thing that happens for people who are working in a marine environment. Um, so I get, getting into the COVID piece of this story, this, this is a website that I look at certain, several times a week at least, and I was looking at it pretty well um, multiple times per day when COVID first started hitting our shores. Uh, it gives you a Canada perspective, but you can also break it down into each province and it gives you a daily update on, on the activity in each province as to what's going on. And the only thing I really wanted to, to, to point out here is that when you look at the total number of infections, and I'm just going to reduce this little panel on the side so I can see, there we go. Um, it, it, this was just, I just took this one off yesterday, so it's not quite up to date, but it's pretty darn up to date. So 92,410 cases have been identified through testing in general or highly suspected cases in Canada. And if you do the, the, the mathematics or the arithmetic that I just put in that little white box at the top, that number of, of diagnosed cases over the total population of Canada equals 0.2 of the population. So what that means is that 99% um, of the population still hasn't, hasn't seen this, this virus yet. So when people are talking about, uh, you know, uh, when, will, when, when will this COVID thing be over? When can we move on? The answer is it's, it's only just begun and, and we're all, we're almost all still vulnerable. So 
this is living with COVID. It's not living after or, you know, when we start reopening, it's all going to be, it's all going to be beautiful again. I mean, the reason that, that things have, have tailed off and, and leveled out to a kind of a constant number of, dis of disease cases per day across the country is that we're doing the, the physical distancing and we're doing uh, a number of changes in our various businesses and practices and people are washing hands more and people are wearing masks. All those things are contributing to, to the uh, tailing off of uh, the, the lack of an acceleration of this disease process, but it's out there and it will continue to spread. Um, uh, over time. So again, this is, this is, it's not over and it's not going to be over for quite some time unless we hear about the, you know, the hallowed vaccine comes, but, but, uh, you know, there are many people that say, listen, the vaccine's not, uh, not a slam dunk by any stretch. The common cold doesn't have a vaccine. That's a coronavirus. HIV doesn't have a vaccine that's been around for decades. So, so there are certain kinds of viruses that just don't, aren't really amenable to, to a vaccine that's going to be effective. So, um, keep that all in mind. Um, right. So th th this is really the, the, the cut your head around it. And we, when we're dealing with, with uh, especially younger folks, but really all age groups, there is this kind of, this, 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 um, st kind of power battle between the, the human desire to want this to be over. You know, Donald Trump saying, yeah, and, and then one day, like a miracle, this will be gone. Or Bar Boris Johnson, who said yesterday that, that he'd like to, to reduce the two meter distancing because it's kind of inconvenient for restaurants and other kinds of business. And, and uh, so, you know, I think we all get that concept of, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could just make this go away? But, but the, the, the brutal reality is, and reality check, is the virus uh, has, got, has got biology and physics and chemistry that's making it work. And so it doesn't care about our human belief systems and our fantasies. Um, and I, and I, I put honesty on, on that, uh, underneath that, that little picture too, because um, the honesty factor is an important thing to think about when you're dealing with workers who um, uh, want to go, uh, if, if their job is dependent on how much fish they catch or, or going out on a trip, you either get paid or you don't get paid. There are gonna be people potentially who are gonna minimize symptoms that could be COVID positive that, that they should be reporting but they, they, they just don't necessarily want to bring it up. Or maybe there's a peer group pressure. They don't want to be like, they don't want, they don't want to be the idiot who could have COVID when everyone else in the group doesn't. So um, I, I think it's really important for employers uh, uh, to kind of can think about um, what are the motivations of, of our people when we're starting to do um, rigorous checks on people? Um, are there reasons why they may be a little bit less honest than one would like? And will that affect things? Uh, and so here, um, yeah, so that, that's why I think that's an important thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, again, the reason that this thing is going to continue to spread and is spreading is, is that, that there are, there's a proportion of people that, that don't have any symptoms. Um, and again, if I was to, to look at the people who I read the, on that earlier um, picture of, of the country where I said that 0.2% of the population have been diagnosed, even if we said, okay, but there's a group out there that haven't been diagnosed, that had the disease, that actually got over it, possibly probably have some degree of immunity. Uh, even if we said that was 10 times that number, we're still only 2% of the population. So it is spreading um, both by people who have minimal symptoms and, and, and are truly asymptomatic. And those are the problem children that we have in our, in our, in our group. Um, and, and then we, again, on, in the shipping world and the marine world, we're going to be working in confined spaces. It's going to be really hard to, to maintain the two meter or more social distancing, physical distancing. There are no treatments. There's no vaccine. Um, oxygen can help those who, who do get sicker. Um, but there's, again, only so much oxygen you can carry on a ship. Uh, and then serious illnesses do happen. And, and um, the, luck, the good news around that is that from the onset of, of symptoms to the development of things getting worse, there are days involved. So it's not as if someone starts developing COVID symptoms and then within a few hours, they're now looking, looking at admission to the ICU. It's gonna be a multiple day progression. And, and the main reason for that is that once the symptoms begin, um, symptoms are often related to the immune system that's starting to kind of wake up and say, okay, there's something going on here. We need to kind of respond. And for those people who get extra sick, it's because their immune system has actually gone a little bit haywire and is really kind of overreacted. 
um, but 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 that that is a time delay thing that that that's uh, that's not going to be immediate. So there is some time once you do see someone who 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 is displaying some symptoms that could be consistent with COVID. Again, you can't carry a, a hospital on board your ship to completely set up with all the you know full pharmacy. So there are going to be limitations and compromises that one has to make. Um, and then we have to sort of figure out, okay, so what do you do about the person who now seems to be displaying those symptoms? Is there a place to keep them that can be isolated? Um, how are we going to cont contact that person, keep an eye on them, um, give them food, get them to the bathroom, you know, all those sort of basic requirements. Um, you need to have pre-thought around what, are, what is our approach to that, to, to that, uh, to that situation. And again, our, our goal is to not have the last bullet show up. We want to keep people who are potentially going to be sick, not available and no virus on the ship. That's the goal. So here's an example of, 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 uh, of, of, not, of that not happening. So this is a, a large fishing ship. You can see it's got a crew, a crew of 126 people. Um, they were doing an isolation apparently of like five days, up to five days, which is not 14 days. Uh, and then they were doing testing. Um, and, uh, and despite that, one or more of their crew got on board that were, that were harboring the virus, whether they were asymptomatic or, or pre-symptomatic. And after a few days, all of a sudden, we're now into 85 of them. I mean, that's, that's a disaster. And it's a disaster not only for the people that are involved in getting the illness. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, we all know that, that not all seafarers are the picture of health. Some of them are going to be members of that risk group of older, uh, some comorbidities, other health problems, uh, and so on. So, um, and so, so you have a disaster that's that's happening for the crew. But, but from a public relations company food processing business point of view, I mean, this is this is not cool. And uh, so, again, you can kind of imagine um, the the fallout of of this particular occurrence, and also taking that ship now out of action for for some time to come while it gets cleaned and analyzed and so on. So. A lot of paperwork got, got generated from that unfortunate uh, um, slip in, in, in screening, screening pra practice. So the other thing is that we've been sort of learning mostly early on in our time and actually well into this, that this is a droplet spread thing that two meters is, is a pretty good distance to keep. Um, more evidence has now been coming out that's saying, well, yeah, that's mostly true. But if someone sort of at the height of their viral infection that even talking like I am right now, I am ex actually, if I was infected, I would be exhaling virus into the air. And, and again, from this diagram, one can appreciate that uh, for, ex for each exhalation, and these may be coughs or sneezes, so it's even more concentrated, but, but uh, you know, look at the distance of two meters um, is indicated, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's two meter mark. Um, and here is, uh, here's a, a larger, that's a six meter mark. So um, it, it's, it's lingering and all you've got to do is then walk along and take a couple of good deep breaths of this concentration of stuff and, and you're now getting the beginning of a loading dose of virus that can have an effect. So it's not just, just droplets, it's not just dropping within a couple of meters. There is going to be an aerosolization of the virus um, in normal uh, in normal activity, especially heavy breathing, sc you know, screaming, yelling, whatever, uh, is gonna is gonna do more. So that that's a problem, especially again in the in the asymptomatic person, who's now uh, who's spreading the joy. Which is why uh, it's so important to be wearing a mask when out in public places where there are other people around. Because uh, twofold, one is you can protect yourself at least partially from walking into that cloud. But secondly, if you happen to be an asymptomatic uh, viral shedder, then you're doing the rest of us a favor by, by trapping the majority of that material in your mask. And so uh, wearing masks in, in public places, uh, and, 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 and we'll talk more about the, the, the use of masks in, in the first 14 days of being on a ship uh, as a potential um, mitigation strategy also. Um, so again, so just basic kind of experiences. Um, I, I think what I, one of the things I've clearly learned over the last few months of talking to crews, many, many, many crews, is you really do need to explain with eye contact. And I've, you know, I have been encouraging companies to really get someone, whoever their leader is of the crew, to, to almost, and maybe ideally, sit down with each individual crew member, make eye contact and say, okay, so here's what isolation means prior to you coming on board our ship. 
It means that you, you, you need to lead an isolated life. We're lucky that m many seafarers, certainly in the Maritimes, live in rural Nova Scotia, rural, rural Newfoundland, wherever. Um, and so their interactions with the outside world is, is, is a lot less than if you were working in an urban setting. So that, that's fortunate. Um, but again, they still need to understand that if you have someone who's living in the household, who's coming and going from your, from your house, who's working outside the home, working in a nursing home or working in a hospital or working in a, in a, in a business of some sort, um, they're going out and they're potentially bringing back virus in, in, during your, your isolation period. Um, going to the going to the stores and so on. So all those things need to be understood And this is really kind of like an extra mindfulness time where we need to be looking at um, uh, wh Where are my hands when I when I'm when I'm out and around? Um, what what's what does the social gathering thing mean? Um, what are the risks and what what is the prevalence of the disease in my area? So again, Currently, we've, we were in a dip phase. The prevalence of, of virus out there, especially in rural settings, is, is really low. Uh, not zero, probably, but, but really low. And so, again, the likelihood of picking it up somewhere right now uh, is, is certainly less than it was a month ago. But, but, uh, but there's still, there still are risks. So, so the importance of self-isolation, again, we, we, we've been strongly advocating that if at all possible, um, in fact, it's really, it's really mandatory. People should be, before getting on board a ship, if you don't want to bring virus on board, you should be isolating either self or people are staying in hotels and, and doing a more strict version of that. You should be doing that for 14 days. That's the time period where the symptoms, are, if you have an infection, are going to show up. Or if you're asymptomatic, your body will have worked through the immune system and will be able to kind of beat this thing down by the time the 14 days have passed. Uh, and so again, you should be you should be as close as we can get to a green light to be able to get on and say, okay, yeah, you know what, you've passed that time period, you are viral free. We now need to get you to your to your to your departure point. And so that's the third bullet at the, at the top part, saying the safe travel of the work site. And so here's an example of, of this is a real life example. So uh, 14 days of of, uh, of isolation by individual crew members um, for a certain group. Um, Seemed to do a good job. I think they were they were they were truly isolating, you know, appropriately living with their family and not getting a lot of outside, you know, activity. Great. So then um, they got a four-hour trip between where these guys live to where they're going to be uh, joining the, the ship, and so they decide, well, why why drive drive four different vehicles? Let's just drive one. So they all pile in together, and they drive the four hours to the to the departure port. And then during our screening, where we, we, we actually are providing some screening for, for various, uh, various companies with a health professional. So uh, we're going through and then, and then one of, the, one of the, 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 the four guys ends up having a fever on, on screening. So we didn't appreciate his fever, but, but he had a fever. So that then means that the other three guys that drove with this person are now out of the game too. So they all have to go and isolate in the hotel or motel and wait for the results of the guy with a fever. Um, you know, well-intentioned, um, not malicious, did played by the rules, but just let that slip and just didn't kind of, you know, keep in mind that you do need to kind of isolate yourselves individually until you can be screened as a final sort of step before getting on board the ship. Um, so again, a, you know, a sad slip that, that, that cost everybody time and grief and, and lots of eye rolling. Um, so again, uh, you, you've got local crew, um, understanding that. You may have people from other provinces. Again, there are provincial rules around that right now, around how, again, the, the, the downtime are going directly on board uh, and isolating or however it's gonna be done. But I think, uh, again, the, the goal is to keep the virus off the ship. Um, and I appreciate that there are costs involved of having people sit around for 14 days um, doing nothing and having to pay for a hotel room. And, and, and I, I totally get that. but but. The, the cost of, of, of that inconvenience, uh, the inconvenience to people don't want to do it or whatever, um, it, it doesn't matter. The virus doesn't care about the inconvenience and the cost and the, uh, the desire to not, not have to do this. The virus says, yeah, good. You want to put people together who one guy has a virus, one guy doesn't, I'm happy with that. I can, I can make this work for me. I'm going to jump across. So you got to keep that in mind. Um, specialists that are coming from other countries and so on, those who, who uh, are, are, are part of the essential services and don't have, to, don't have to isolate. I think you just have to be super wary. If that person 
for whatever reason doesn't have to isolate and you're gonna put them on board your ship and you don't really know what the true status is, there better be a plan for cleaning and monitoring and gowning this person because uh, I, I just, I don't totally, I don't totally get the, uh, the essential services, you, know, it, you don't have to isolate rule. I just can't quite get the, my head around that one. So the, uh, certainly testing has been a, a, a really popular thing. Well, great, there's a test out there. Can't we just test our people? We can get rid of this or at least we can reduce or maybe even eliminate the, the isolation piece and, and the test will, will tell us the answer. Are they good to go or not? Uh, and the, uh, obviously I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this because that is absolutely just not the case. It's not how it works. So I know this looks kind of complicated, but it, it's not complicated really at all. And so medicine is not, uh, and, and medicine tests are not like the metrics or the instruments that one uses, again, in the marine industry or other places where it gives you a number that is kind of a, you know, an accurate number as long as the test is being done properly, the machine is calibrated and so on. Medicine is, is a series of probabilities. And, uh, and so you, you gather a history, you take a good, you know, solid story from someone, you do a physical examination, you maybe decide to do a test or two, uh, and maybe an x-ray or two or whatever, uh, and you come up with, with a series of, of, of yeses and nos that you then put together to affect your assessment of whether you think this person has this problem or not. So it's not black and white. It's not like a pregnancy test, which is close to black and white. Um, yes, no, you're pregnant. Um, uh, even that is not sort of perfect either. But, but in the case of the COVID test, um, the COVID test is a, is a viral RNA test. Um, and so it's looking for a specific infection that you have right this moment. Um, but it doesn't perform like a yes, no test. It performs better if the, if the test is positive, and it's not that great when the test is negative. So here's a, so again, so I kind of said that, that uh, what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna basically get a history from this person. So, you know, have you been exposed to somebody with COVID, uh, possibly, are you living in, a, in an area where there's some prevalence of the, of the virus? Um, are your symptoms, you know, potentially consistent with, with what could be with COVID. So, I, you know, I, t I take the history, maybe do an examination, listen to the chest um, and uh, get the oxygen saturation and so on and say, yeah, you know, well, you got some features of COVID, but then you've, it, it's, not, it's not super convincing. I, you know, it's kind of a 50-50, 50% chance that you could have it. And that's my, so that's my pre-test probability, which is along the bottom axis, the X axis. So let me do the test and do the swab and it comes back and, and it's a positive test. So for a positive test, what you do looking at this graph is you go to the, to the upper curved uh, kind of a convex um, um, uh, curve and you draw a line up from the 50% uh, pretest probability and you end up with a post-test probability of around 90%. So a positive test in the setting of a 50-50 sort of case will um, improve your, 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 your post-test probability saying, yeah, you know what, you, you've got a 90% chance of having COVID. Um, so that, that, that's a useful, uh, a useful test to kind of, you know, ba basically make the diagnosis. Okay, yeah, you're, you're, you're COVID positive, we need to kind of, you know, do whatever as a result. Let's say I'm 50-50 on this, on this person, I do the test and it's negative. Well, a negative test is, is gonna give you a different kind of, of outcome. So if again, if we, if we draw from, from, to do a straight line up from 50, uh, uh, the lower convex curve is the one you're gonna use for negative tests. And so what I've done is I've reduced my pretest probability of an iffy 50-50. Uh, there's still a 25% chance this person could have, uh, could be positive, that this was actually a false negative test. And so, the problem with this test is it's, it's a good rule-in test. I said, you know, I, I think you probably have COVID uh, and you have a positive test and therefore, you know what, you've got COVID. Um, versus, you know, I think you might have COVID um, and then I get a negative test. I can't say for sure that you don't have it. I can say, well, it's a little bit less likely, but you know, I'm still not, I, I don't know. So it's a good rule-in test, but it's not a good rule-out test. And what you guys are looking for is you're looking for a test that will rule out virus in each one of your crew members prior to them getting on board a boat. And so this test, 
um, used in the incorrect setting is not going to achieve that goal. We do use the test for some clients of ours, uh, and, but the people that we're using it with are people who are doing a strict isolation for 14 days. So they're reducing the pretest probability to a really, really small percentage, a small number. And then we're doing the icing on the cake test. Uh, and we're doing it twice in, 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 in many cases because we know that there's still fallibil fallibility of this test. So we're doing it twice uh, as the icing on the icing on the cake to say, okay, listen, you know, we've done a really good strict isolation. That really honestly is good enough if you do it well, but let's do a test on top of that in that setting. And now I can reduce the probability to a, to a, a really small acceptable number. But to use it on the general public and say, are you positive or negative, that's going to be my, my decision tree, is an incorrect and improper use of the test. And so it can't be used willy-nilly uh, in screening our, our seafarers. I hope that's clear, and I'm happy to answer questions later on about that. The other test uh, testing out there is the antibody test, which really is, is, is a retrospective test. It's asking, uh, are, do you have antibodies to a previous infection? Um, and so that, that would have been days, weeks ago. Uh, it's not going to be useful for you um, for sort of pr prospectively asking, can this seafarer get on board a ship prior to departure? Are they COVID-free? COVID that would not be the test you want to use. So we've been asked by a number of com companies, can they start using the antigen, ant antigen test as, as, the, as their kind of standard? And the answer is absolutely not. would not be appropriate. So um, you have to be vigilant once they get on board the ship. Um, so extra PPE, cleaning uh, vigorously. Uh, you should have a medical kit that's, that's reasonably comprehensive. The first 14 days, we suggest that you should, should be doing t daily temperature checks. Uh, I, I, I kind of am fa in favor of, of twice a day, ideally, because it just gives you an earlier pickup if something is starting to brew and, and it reduces the, the touch piece of that person wandering around for a further 12 hours. Um, should be asking, you know, guys, you got any, any, any new cough, any new sneezes, belly sore, whatever. Uh, and I mentioned the cleaning already. And then again, what happens if people do have symptoms? Um, and there's a bit of a difference between the young, young, healthy guy versus the older and unhealthy. Um, you might have, you might, might decide that you, depending on the project, whether you might want to try and see if they, they can just resolve on their own. We know most 80, 80, Almost 85% of people are going to do fine from their COVID, just feel crappy for a little while. Um, the older, unhealthier person, I would be getting them off the ship um, as soon as possible. Again, we have days to kind of work with, but, but uh, the sooner the better. Um, you do have to have contact shore and you have to have an isolation room. So you need to think about what is our approach if the worst of the worst does happen and someone develops the symptoms. Um, you're going to communicate to everybody, explain this, explain this. you're going to re-explain it, you're going to re-explain it one more time because people, you know, the change management process is painful. Um, and then there are a number of, 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 uh, of a th kind of basically regulatory things that need, you need to be aware of. This, um, this, this is actually just a nice infographic that's provided by the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, in collaboration with Transport Canada. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, again, sort of a quick summary of, of uh, what the things uh, that you need to consider and, and know about. And there are lots of regulations around health reporting when returning uh, back into a port uh, in terms of timing and, and letting people know what's happening on board your ship. So those are all regulatory uh, requirements and, and uh, I won't spend any time on that. Um, again, resources available. Uh, again, if anybody wants copies of this particular presentation, um, you're, if we'd be happy to send those out. Um, this is some of the references uh, that I've either referred to and, and just some other ones that I, I didn't necessarily talk about, but, but certainly very good, easy reads that, that do explain a number of things. Uh, the Fisheries Safety Association, I should give them a plug. I think they've done a good job for smaller vessels in terms of, uh, of some, some really good information that they, they've posted on their websites. Uh, and there's also a, a good video um, on, on just the use of PPE. So um, it's not just uh, like you're putting on work clothes and take them off again. There, there's certain ways, especially when you have someone on board your ship who you suspect could be COVID positive, um, you can contaminate yourself very, very quickly. And which is why healthcare workers, uh, if they have the PPE at all, why healthcare workers are, are certainly at risk of getting COVID because there's really specific ways to take this stuff off without getting virus on you on the way off. Uh, so it's a, it's a good video to watch on how to do that. So I'm open to questions um, and I'll maybe turn over to uh, 
to Jim, um, and I'll just uh, put that up there for your information. Uh, if you want to contact me or Michelle, who's our operations manager, who I think is also on the, on the uh, presentation right now, um, be happy to try and answer questions a little uh, later on too. All right. John, that's fantastic. Wonderful uh, <laughs> set of information and certainly very helpful. Uh, I have a few questions, but there's been some coming in on the chat line as well. A couple of the questions uh, revolve around, are these slides available? And I think you just answered that. So yep. um, certainly they are uh, either directly from Praxis or if it's easier, uh, we can pass them on on your behalf. So yes, by all means. And um, and I think um, so if, if I may too, yeah. just if the if the recording can go along with it, then obviously that would be kind of helpful because uh, they they are kind of a little bit uh, dry statically. So. Yeah. So no normally at the end of these, we send out a follow up survey to those that have been online, and included with that would be a recording of this and access to the slides. So uh, if you're looking for for more information, for those of you who have been taking copious notes, I apologize. <laughs> You do get the slides and the and the uh, recording after the fact. Uh, a question's come up that I'm, I'm fascinated by, and it really revolves around what about the short trip situation, where someone a researcher is going out for a day trip in in Bedford Basin or offshore, or a fisherman is going or fisher is going off offshore for a day trip. Practically and pragmatically, what steps can they take um, short of isolating for 14 days to go for a one day trip? Yeah, no, that's that, that that's that's a good point. I, I I look at at many of those kinds of situations as being basically the same as what you do on land. I think um, ideally you would like to have the people that uh, know ahead of time they're going to be doing that that they are you know, minimizing their contact. Again, the fourteen day period is a, is a pretty magic number. Um, it's it's based on on knowing that it's it's probably closer to eleven days, maybe twelve. 90, I think 97, 96% of the, of the population will have done something by that by that time period. But the 14 days is is kind of rounded out, which is probably not not an, not an unreasonable thing to do. But but for those who are going out for short trips, I, I think getting virus on the ship, if it if it ended up happening, um, is is far less of a disaster than for the uh, a number of our clients that go out for five, six weeks at a time, even even several weeks at a time. Um, they're going off remotely. Um, it's a costly, technically, logistically difficult thing to have to turn that ship around or organize a medevac. There's weather involved. And so those ones are, are the ones that we're really kind of focused on saying we need to kind of be absolutely rabid in our attempts to keep the virus off the, sh off the ship. If you're going out for shorter time periods, um, you're going to be able to come back and return if somebody starts to, to displaying symptoms. It's going to be annoying for sure. Um, but then you can go through and you can clean um, known contact surfaces and you, you'll have to do the contact screening and so on. But, uh, but I would say, yeah, shorter trips are, 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 are less of an issue. I would still encourage people to try and uh, those who are in this, in this kind of work environment, um, partying uh, in a crowded dance hall, um, you, you know, getting wasted uh, and not remembering what you were doing uh, is, is not, a, not a good practice uh, and it's going to be COVID friendly, which is what, not what we want. Um, so I think, I think people just need to be kind of, again, mindful and wary, wary about that. Just react, would, would PPE help uh, in those kind of confined spaces, uh, you know, for a day yeah. on ship? Yeah, it's good. That, that, that's a good point. I didn't didn't really sort of say that enough, but but I I, I PPE. I mean, I don't think you have to wear the, the full hazmat suit. Uh, I think for for sure, wearing a mask, this you know surgical um, or just even the cloth masks that people have been making. Uh, is a good practice, and it goes back to that that graphic with with the the sneeze cough talk uh, cloud. Um, you're going to be um, helping out those with you if you happen to be one of those asymptomatic viral shedders, uh, and you're also going to be protected from some, some, from somebody else. So I, I, I think again, especially for day trips uh, or you know several days out at a time, I think when you're out of your sleeping zone, I, I just stick the mask on when you're going to be interacting with other people. And mm -hmm. we've been saying the same thing for, for the first 14 days of, of uh, groups that are, that are going out uh, for longer trips. So the, you know, the five, feet, uh, five weeks of, uh, or six weeks of, of shrimp, uh, shrimp fishing you know, south of Greenland group. Um, 
temperature checks regularly, cleaning everything, uh, social distancing. You don't get to play cribbage and cards for the first few little while. Wear a mask when you guys are hanging out together, if you can possibly you know, get your heads around that. It seems goofy, um, but once the 14 day period for that longer group is done, then, then you basically have proven that you're okay. You can relax that stuff. Um, but I think, yeah, short, short trips, um, hand washing, mask wearing, distancing when possible, uh, are all good strategies. Another question has come in, which is kind of related. So what about situations where seafarers may be uh, working for more than one employer and moving between vessels, either on land or, you know, God forbid, a situation where you're transferring uh, an emergency patient between ship A and ship B for, you know, for, for obvious reasons. Any recommendations, any thoughts on those situations? Uh, well, so... I mean, ideally, if you're on the ship in the first place and you've followed the rules, you should be going from a non-virus ship to non-virus ship, theoretically, right? Um, yeah, I, I think the, the Coast Guard, uh, if also one of our one of our clients, has, has kind of you know faced this. What if we go out there, we've done our thing, but our job is to go and respond to people's emergency. We have a ship that now has a viral guy on board that we've now got to transfer for whatever reasons what's that all going to be about and and they've got it there they now would be putting on full ppe um to to handle that sick person um but yeah people who are working on multiple things it, it gets a little bit like like the people who've been working in multiple nursing homes yeah i was just gonna say right yeah. i mean it's uh again that was a higher risk group a more vulnerable group you're going ideally from uh, from a sterile ship to a sterile ship but but uh, boy, you know, I just, I think what I, I keep encountering when I, and I'm gonna keep emphasizing is that picture of the fantasy thing. I think people want it to be a certain way, but the virus doesn't care about, about what, what, what makes fiscal uh, sense for us. What, what's the cheapest, what's the, the fastest, what's the whatever, um, you know, the specialist, technician guy is only in the city for a while. We, we, he's he's, he's got to go to three different ships. Uh, we better know who this guy is and where he's come from um, and, and what he's doing in between ship visits. Because uh, again, he could be a classic type ordinary where now you all of a sudden have, have wiped out three ships because this person um, didn't, didn't screen appropriately, didn't, didn't wear PPE, whatever. So we're, we're back to the human factors piece of this whole exercise, which um, is uh, you know, putting out an email, um, saying, uh, putting up a poster, um, however you want to communicate with your crew to say, okay, listen, guys, I'm serious. You can't do the following or you must do whatever um, is, is, is one way to do this. But I think people truly do need to be sat down and understand what does this mean to me? And it, it goes back to those guys who drove together in the car. I mean, they well-intentioned, but didn't kind of, you know, make that, that, that final step. Um, uh, how's this going to impact me? So, John, I've got a question that's, that's not specifically marine side, but it's sort of a generic question. And I'm not a doctor and certainly not an epidemiologist, but is there a certain inevitability to this that by flattening the curve, invariably, if there is no uh, magic solution of a vaccine, that over some prolonged period of time, we will all be exposed to this? Is that, is that the case? Yeah, that, that, is, that is basically how it will play out. Um, we've all heard of herd immunity. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a point where enough of us, um, in, and I've seen such variable numbers, I still don't know what, 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 what herd immunity the number is, but you know, from 50% to 70%, whatever the number needs to be, that, and really what that means is you've got a number of people who have been exposed, they've got some, some, uh, some uh, antibodies, they have some degree of immunity. We don't even know how long the immunity is gonna last if, mm -hmm. if, if you are immune, right? And maybe there's variable immunity, maybe there's like sort of immune and really immune, I don't know. Uh, maybe it only lasts for a few months, maybe it lasts for a year or two. We, don't, we, none of, we just don't really know any of that stuff. But let's assume that we stop time, every, uh, a number of people get, in, get infected, which is, which is what you're suggesting, and, and, and that's, that's 
the way it has to work. It's going to continue to spread. Uh, we're only we're not even at one percent yet, but but uh, you know we're, it's going to continue to spread. We will then develop people who are immune in, in in various places. And really, what that's effectively doing is it's making it less easy for the virus to mm -hmm. start jumping. Like away. stopping a forest fire by cutting trees. Is it? Exactly, it's the yeah. same exactly the same sort of concept. So at some point, it then just is unable to reproduce. Runs out of fuel. Yeah. Yeah, but but then it becomes it becomes part of uh, the background noise. Like this this virus has basically been added to our file of of seasonal or recurrent viruses that are going to be with our human species forever until again, unless unless there's some kind of uh, treatment or eradication method. But it'll just be part of the of, of, of the the regular influenza that comes every year. It'll be it'll be this outbreak of uh, Ebola that's just you know popped up again in the Congo. Um, or, or, or uh, uh, Democratic Republic. Um, so, so John, that, that would imply there will be changes yeah. of business behaviors and social behaviors, fundamental ones, for a long time. This is not a tactical solution to a problem. This is going to be something that we may be changing methods of operation for a, for a long period of time. That's the way I've kind of, I, no one's, no one's suggested otherwise. Again, there's that sort of the fantasy talk, the Boris Johnson, the, the Trumps and whoever, who are kind of talking about we want to go back to normal again. I mean, the normal that, that we knew in February, uh, it, it just, like, I don't know how large gatherings at concerts and, uh, you know, and even the, the, the packed in restaurants, the bars that were crawling with people, I, I just don't know how that's possibly going to return again for some time to come. Like it, it just, it, I just don't see how it's possible. So yeah, I mean, this is, we have a, we have a, we have a new thing that's going on and, and, uh, None of us have ever experienced it, so it's it's just it's hard to wrap your head around and say, well, what? I have nothing to compare to, um, but that seems to be that's the, if you look at the viral biology, that's that's the nature of the beast. So there's two questions arising that are kind of related. Uh, one is um, it's obviously a key issue. So can you expound a little bit on uh, prior to boarding self isolation? What how do you see that working? What, what are the options in terms of how to do that? Maybe just a a few more words from you on that. Yeah, okay, sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I'll give you an example of, of the multiple um, commercial fishing companies that we've been working with, um, primarily, I guess a few others too, but um, so what they've been doing is they, they've been instructing their crew members that they need to lead an isolated life, uh, which is again, not terribly inconsistent with their normal, which is good, but make some, make some modifications that are appropriate during that 14 day period and, and the same as going out shopping whether it's uh, the seafarer him or herself uh, or a spouse when you bring stuff back you, you basically clean off the outside of the of the cereal box and the soup can and so on which again seems bizarre but but that, if, what if someone with covid touched that soup can and, and then put it back on the shelf again so so you know trying to to be mindful of how can the virus basically get at me in my little bubble world and then transport yourself from your isolated existence to the port of departure. Um, and when the 30 guys get together, keep yourself physically isolated, distanced. Um, and what we've been doing, and, and this is not, not something that, that, that we have to do, but I mean, the company needs to sort of figure out how they want to do it. Uh, we've been doing it as kind of an arm's length service for the, for the companies. Uh, a health health provider or someone with a thermometer um, and a little checklist basically goes through the question. So have you been exposed to anybody who's been you know, potentially COVID pro proven or, or possible? Yes, no. Um, travel outside the province, still still uh, in, in, in force. Um, any symptoms of any of these things? Blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. Uh, and then we do a temperature. And we do a temperature check on these people um, using a, a well calibrated device um, and we're, we're using a, a lower than fever diagnosis um, in the textbook temperature of 38.0 we're using 37.5 just based on on years of experience of seeing people adults with with a with a 37.5 or higher temperature is often there's something brewing and uh, and that's kind of like that early detector to temperature so it's got to be done well um, the, even just taking the temperature has got some nuances to it you can't come in from the cold um, you can't have your hat on uh, prior to having your temperature forehead thing done you know if it's an infrared um, the ear device needs to be 
properly positioned. So there are some, some uh, important things. You shouldn't be just doing temperature checks as theater. It's gotta be actually a legitimate temp temperature check. But that's kind of like our final phase. We haven't been doing COVID testing on people. It's, uh, it's expensive, um, uh, it takes time. And as you already saw, if you properly self-isolate um, and you can do a final check on people, I'm touching wood right now vigorously, but we, we've been lucky so far in the last three months of, of doing multiple crew changes for multiple companies, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people are now come and gone and multiple times um, using this method. And again, touching wood, we, we've, been, we've been lucky so far. The other, the other good news around this too is that th that kind of, practice um, has re great, greatly reduced the common cold and, and probably will be good for influenza yeah, too. Yeah, so we, we, haven't, we haven't been seeing nearly as much of those sort of things. A little bit of, of, of seasonal allergies have popped up as kind of a confuser, but, but, uh, but that, that's really the, the best method. And then, and then despite that, I'm still saying uh, for the first 14 days on board, you never know, did someone make a slip that we just didn't pick up on? Let's assume there's still someone on board that's, that's, that's COVID, COVID positive. Let's check those temperatures. Let's keep the masks on when we can. Let's do some physical distancing during that first 14 days. Um, if, again, if it's going to be a longer trip. Um, and then, so John, I know this was not meant to be a sales presentation per se, but there's questions coming in. If there were specific uh, marine operations companies that needed some uh, short-term consultancy around those processes and procedures, Presumably that's something that Praxis could provide for them. Is that fair? We've, we've learned a lot from working with these companies. So this has been an empirical experience uh, as well as reading lots. I mean, yes, so that's, that's something we, uh, that's interesting, interesting to us and we'd be happy to help. I think we've, we've uh, accumulated a fair amount of, of uh, empirical experience over the last X number of months to uh, try and figure this stuff out. I've got a few more questions coming in. I've got one I want to throw and then I've got a few more coming in. Go. Yeah. What, what about cleanliness and sanitizing on board a ship. Are there any specific comments you could make there? What, what sorts of things should be, uh, should the crew and captain be considering in terms of that? Yeah, great. Um, so yes, I think it, having um, more hand si sanitizer available to people is, is, is good. So trying to put those in, in a, few, a few different spots. Uh, one of the companies we deal with uh, actually hired an extra person on their crew whose job it is exclusively to just do cleaning. And they basically start at the top of the ship and they work down to the bottom. And when they're done, they start and they go back to the top and they just basically do that during the trip. Uh, and again, at least for the first 14 days, right? You can slack off once uh, someone. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's been good for us as, a, as humans to actually up our game in terms of personal hygiene and, and to sort of, you know, being aware of, of, of where our hands are going and, and not coughing, you know, and sneezing in the usual sort of gross way. So, um, but, but, but the, the, all the contact surfaces need to be, need to be looked at and, you know, how many, how many places do people put their hands? Well, geez, a, a lot, the handrails in the, in the, in the, in the, in the hallways, uh, you know, the, 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 the waterproof doors, all that stuff. I mean, there's, Places where, where we where we end up touching, going into the galley, um, uh, the, the 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 ketchup bottle, the the salt shakers, all those sort of things are multi-person contact points. Um, so food services, um, galley, um, uh, or to, you know, sort of individuals grabbing onto the spoon and, and ladling on whatever they want, should change to someone actually um, spooning out the stuff. As if so, one person that's sort of taking care of that, come with your plate. Um, smaller groups of people eating together as opposed to large groups of people, so different staggering times. Um, there's, there's, there are a number of kind of behaviors that you need to really entertain and think about, um, especially around the bathroom cleanings, but, but, but in terms of just trying to mi minimize the number of times that people are pal you know, piled in together. Certain ships are going to be more amenable to that, other ones not so much. Um, but I, but I, I think if you kind of look through uh, what's the day in the life of a seafarer on board this ship look like uh, uh, pre-COVID and what are the things that we can do to try and, uh, and, and, and minimize the touch parts and clean those uh, and be aware of them. Um, there's a lot of really good strategies that people are coming up with. Mm. Does it, I mean, there's all, all sorts of studies that show that um, companies that do extensive first aid training with their staff, the, the prevalence of incidents and accidents goes down because people are more mindful. Is there a sort of an element of that in this? Should we be doing more preemptive training and awareness raising among crews? 
Yeah, no, I think, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough about the prevention piece of this. You, the goal is to keep a virus off the ship, period. And so whatever one can do prior to getting on, walking up the gangway is what you want to do. Um, we don't want to be like that Atlantic destiny ship in, in Seattle um, and have to now, you know, do damage control and, or, or, or like all the cruise ships. When, when this thing first broke back, uh, back in 2019, uh, and early, early uh, 2020, you know, you know, all those cruise ships cruising around with people that are progressively getting more and more infected as they went around. I mean, that's, that's just, that, that's it just, it's yeah, horrible. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I think you, you, you really do need to think about what can we do to, 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 to keep our, our crews healthy. And this has been a, a real benefit of the COVID thing is people are actually now aware of the health and safety. It used to be, you know, H, S, and E, and, and with the H kind of totally forgotten everything about safety. Um, but, but I think the health piece is actually, a bit, people are becoming a bit more aware of that. You know, how do I keep my immune system good? And maybe I should be eating better. Maybe I need to make sure that the stress and you know, maybe there's good sleep, sleep available. Uh, uh, and Transport Canada actually just uh, last year was one of their focuses was around, was around crew sleep and, uh, and, and, and alertness. And all those things are, are, are important to keep crew healthy. But as you mentioned, the more you talk about this stuff, the more you again do that eye eye contact. So you say, okay, Joe in the in the in the in the engine room, how does this change of behavior affect you and what you do in your job? Let's walk through a day in the life of the engineer. Um, what sort of things can you do differently um, to be to be safer from the COVID point of view, and 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 maybe a side spin is and maybe even safer just in your job in, in general. A question coming in just on, on the chronology, the sort of the evolution of this. So I'm initially exposed by whatever means to, you know, the virus. Um, just walk through on an average case basis, how long do things take to progress? In the case of the question, they're saying, how long from that first no symptoms to needing medical attention? Yeah. Recognizing it's probably variable individual to individual, but can you just yeah. walk us through that a bit? Oh, but that, that's great. Thanks. Um, so there's, there's a, yeah, a couple pieces to that. One is... Um, what was the viral load that one got? And that seems to be a factor. So again, if I'm with uh, somebody who's sort of at the height of their viral shedding, I'm with them for a number of, of like an hour or so, and they're, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm sucking in a whole bunch of virus and I'm getting it into my lungs uh, and, 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 and seeding it deeply in my lungs, I'm gonna get a, a worse, probably faster, more, potentially even more severe event than somebody who touches a surface that where the, where the viruses are almost dead. And I get, a, I get a couple of them, but you know, it's sort of a lower dose. So, and it's going to depend on, on sort of how it gets in my body. So you're, you're right, right off the bat. I mean, it, there's going to be some variability, but if you took sort of take a group of people who are COVID positive, what does this look like? Um, so there's a, there's a get in, the virus gets in your system, completely nothing going on in terms of, of symptoms. It starts to, it, it finds, uh, finds cells that it wants to replicate in. Uh, and there are certain cells with receptors that are more likely. And so again, the respiratory tree system, the, the lungs, the, 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 the bronchi and so on are more likely to, to receive virus uh, more happily than other parts of our body, but it can go anywhere. Um, then it replicates and it starts to rep replicate and it basically starts damaging cells as, as it gets to the replication form at the point where it, it can't be contained inside that cell, it basically just bursts and breaks that cell. And so you start getting cellular damage as a result. Um, again, at this point, you may, you may not have any symptoms. You might get a little sort of something, maybe a bit of a cough, but, um, but maybe not, not a whole lot. The immune system then is now starting to be triggered by this, this, this new virus. And so, again, we're now three, four days into this whole thing. And the very first uh, prototype uh, uh, immunoglobulin or, or antibody is, is formed. It's called the IgM. And so it's the first one that, that starts to try and fight back this thing. And it's, it's pretty good, but it's got like a handgun. Um, it's not sort of, uh, it doesn't have a, a lot of ammo to work with, but at least it's a start. And, and simultaneously, the IgG, which is a more specific, more sophisticated, stronger um, uh, uh, antibody is now being, de is being developed. And so um, IgM around day five, and that's when people start developing their symptoms. So we, we often sort of see the peak of, of, of symptom development on around, around day four, day five. And that's because the immune system is now starting to kick in. There's a release of inflammatory uh, uh, chemicals that are starting to cause some symptoms as a result of the inflammation uh, in response to this virus. 
Uh, and then the IgG starts kicking in around day six, seven, eight, somewhere 10 maybe, so it's kind of variable. Um, and that's where, that's where the hammer sort of starts to fall. So again, a person with a more severe infection um, uh, may again be relatively asymptomatic for the first few days, um, starting to develop symptoms a, a, a bit earlier on, um, and, then, um, and then start getting more severe. But that's probably around day six, day seven, somewhere kind of later. So again, what, what I was saying earlier, if you get someone who's got symptoms uh, right this moment, um, they have been, they have been uh, uh, virally shedding prior to that. So wherever they've been touching and going for two or three or four days before that, um, it, that's going to be, that's where, that's where this thing gets spread. That's the pre-symptomatic phase. Day four, day five is where you'll start seeing some people with symptoms. Um, uh, and then, and then, uh, and then, and then, then you still have some time between symptom onset and now, you know what, this person is actually getting pretty sick. This is not, this is one of the unlucky people. 80% um, of them, as I mentioned earlier, will go through this like a bad cold, like a bad flu, maybe like not much of anything, and then will recover and, and uneventful, stay at home and just power through with a couple of Tylenol. Um, about 15, 20% will get sicker, they get admitted to hospital, they require oxygen supplementation, so you know, the, the little nasal prongs up their nose, maybe a mask if they need more, more oxygen, they stay on that for five days, six days, and then they come off it and they go home. Uh, but then a, a small percentage, so we're now down to three, four, five percent or less, um, are going are gonna to end up having to be in the ICU and intubated on a ventilator, and about 50% of them die. So, um, you know, that's a, a, that, but that's a time progression. So like I said earlier, if someone was to develop symptoms of COVID, uh, they're not gonna all of a sudden um, crump uh, or get super sick. It's gonna be a, a progressive thing where you can organize the ship diversion, have Coast Guard come out and meet, uh, take the person off, get, get a medevac if that's required, whatever, whatever the circumstances. Um, many, many ships do carry a bit of oxygen, uh, but you can't carry unlimited numbers of tanks. Um, the more flow you put on, the, the shorter the tank is going to last. Mm -hmm. And so it'll buy you a few hours of, of time, but it's not going to buy you um, um, days and you know. weeks. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. We're, uh, this is fascinating, and our, our time is our just time about to run down. Yeah. Uh, but I do, there's one more question, just to, just to confirm the sort of thing. Um, question coming in about a lot of the scientific missions this individual is aware of is, are switching to single occupancy cabins. Does that make sense? Good thing to do? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think ideally it's missing. the nursing the nursing homes have taught us a few things that that that's again one of them. Um, I think if if that's possible, then that's good. I, I, again, having having said that, well, it, yeah. So so if you're doing screening on, on top of that, like are you doing isolating uh, and screening prior to getting on board? Again, the the goal is ninety nine percent sure that no one on board my crew has the virus. But if there's still a 1% or 2% chance of maybe there is, then not having people crew together, uh, if possible, or sleep together, um, is obviously uh, that much better. So now we're not breathing each other's aerosols. Mm -hmm. And if one guy's you know, breathing out virus, I'm, you're not, not going to take out two guys, um, one of whom becomes asymptomatic. And you know, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's really just physical distancing at night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a, a question here that's kind of more in the grand philosophical category, which is how does this situation differ from the pandemic of 1917-18? Uh, we are two minutes over time, but if you want to stick handle that one for a minute, <laughs> that'd be an interesting way to end our conversation. How does it differ? Well, yeah, so that, that's, that, that's a good one. And, and I, I probably, I, it was because I was reading about that a little while ago, I probably have a more detailed answer with facts and things. But I think that, I think so, so the key difference is that I'm uh, aware of is first of all, it, it is 2020. We, we do know more, we have more technology. Uh, we're aware of the second wave, uh, although again, we're, we're talking about everyone knows the second wave is coming and yet we all kind of want to do, you know, all get back together and all be normal again. And so that's kind of encouraging the second wave. But uh, I, I think we're, we're, we're probably more aware, we're better, we're better, we're gonna be better prepared when another wave comes because the PPE, obviously we, we were short of all that stuff. Uh, I think people are now, uh, more tuned to having the distance, so we may have to when when, when a second wave comes, which was the the bigger killer in, in the in the nineteen eighteen uh, pa uh, pandemic. Um, that uh, that that we'll be able to kind of turn some of that stuff back on again, and people will be reluctant, but they'll get it. So uh, I, I think we, we're we're better positioned than we're then, but um, it, it's yeah, there there are many similarities for sure. 
John, I, I'm going to end it there. I first of all want to thank you. You're a, you're a busy individual these days, I know, given the circumstances. So we really appreciate your taking an hour of your valuable time to spend with us. We've had, uh, I think, upwards of 60 or 70 people online, some really wonderful questions coming in. Uh, on the screen, I think you'll still see the, uh, the contact information for Praxis. And um, I think it's fair to say that if there are further questions, they can reach out directly to yourself or to Michelle at uh, yeah. Praxis. Is that fair? Yeah, happy, happy to do that, yeah. And thank, thank you for, uh, for, again, enabling this to happen. And it's been fun to, to talk to you. It's been a pleasure, John. So uh, thank you, folks, for joining us. Um, if, you're more, if you're interested in uh, the greater things that we're doing here at Cove uh, beyond this presentation, I invite you to go to our webpage, which is uh, www.coveocean.com, and uh, please join us for uh, some, some of our future presentations. Thanks again uh, to Dr. John Ross for joining us and giving us some wonderful insights into the COVID-19 situation and how we can all respond as uh, professionals in the marine environment. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.